Um, I don't know if it's everyone or just me that can see the. Oh, I think they gone away. Never mind. Yeah, I have to clean this out. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I want to welcome you to the Black Family Technology Awareness Program. My name is Loki Yerima, and with me, I have Adeola, I have Enquija, I have Habilu, and we are going to be walking you through scratching the surface of STEM. We are members of the Black Graduate Student Association of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and we are very happy to have you join us today. So, our outline for today is going to include our opening remarks, which we are going through right now. We are going to have an introduction to STEM. We'll talk about some skills and careers that involve STEM. Then we'll play with some coding, and then we'll move on to the closing remarks. So, before we start, I would like to give us a quote. I have right here a nice picture of the Hubble Space Telescope, and I have a quote by Hubble himself, which he says that man has been equipped with five senses, and with these senses, we are able to explore the universe. And this exploration, or you may call it the adventure, we call it science. So we have been given five senses, and with these senses, we continue to explore the universe around us. And uh, this exploration is what we call science. And today, we are going to be walking you through science and technology. So without wasting time, I'm going to pass it on to my next presenter, who is going to be talking about science and the technology in details. So um, what is STEM? So this term is typically used to address curriculum choices in schools, and the acronym STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. So STEM is a broad term used to group together these academic disciplines. And um, science is uh, discovering the natural world. And science, to study science, is a systematic study of the structure and behaviors of physical and natural world through observation and experiments. So if you were to major in science in college, you'll uh, major in biology, astronomy, or chemistry, physics, and so forth. And technology is the tools to reach our goals. And uh, technology, the application is of like scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially for use in industry. So you may study virtual reality, artificial intelligence, or computer aided designs. And then we have engineering. You can hit next. Which is designing and building the future. So engineering draws on uh, pretty much all of the STEM fields and applies them to solve problems and to create an Innovative devices, and you could major in mechanical engineering, electrical, aerospace, biomedical engineering, and um, more even industrial systems engineering as well. And last but not least, we have mathematics, which is pursuing the truth. So mathematics deals with the logic of shape, quantity, and arrangements. So you may um, study topics such as numbers, formulas, uh, and shapes. 
in, in structures and different and understanding the um, changes in quantities. And just a few facts about STEM. Um, STEM education builds on um, critical thinking and problem solving skills, which can be useful for things you encounter throughout life. And also college STEM majors um, often out earn other college grads. So now that we know what STEM means, let's talk about what are the skills that we need to pursue a STEM education. So, with engineering, you could pursue careers like software, mechanical, aerospace, electrical, or other types of engineering. And to do that, you need skills like a technical knowledge, creativity, problem solving, critical skills, communication, and so on and so forth. We're going to notice that communication comes up in all the STEM um, disciplines, so it's one important feature you need to have if you want to pursue a STEM major. With science, you can become a doctor, a researcher, chemist, biology, biologist, and so on and so forth. And to do that, you need observation, communication, prediction, or research skills. For technology, you could be an IT, software developer, web designer, or different types of engineers. And for that, you need technical communication again, problem solving, time, and project management skills. Lastly, in mathematics, you can be a cryptographer, an economist, statistician, mathematician, and so on. And for this, it's important that you have quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, and again, communication skills. So let's do a little activity and talk about what kind of STEM discipline you need for different jobs or careers. So does anyone want to tell me what kind of STEM discipline you need for any of the careers listed up here? You can unmute yourself and... Communication? Yes, you need communication. Who is that? Sorry. Uh, my name is Raquel. Yes, thank you for saying that. Yes, you need communication for each of the STEM careers, but can you tell me is it science, technology, engineering, or mathematics that you need for any of the jobs to set up here? Uh, I think, I believe, like, you need mathematics for each and every one of those. Yes, that's a very good observation. So you do need mathematics for each of these. Specifically, if you want to des design, like, a space shuttle, you will probably need technology or engineering skills. If you want to design drugs or work with the DNA, you definitely need science. Or if you want to be a computer engineer or coder, you probably definitely need technology skills. So that's a good observation. You do need communication skills for each of these. So that's the first activity we have. Moving on, I think we have a video to watch. Yeah, so um, again, uh, we'll be watching a video uh, for, it's a short video, 10 minutes video. So uh, let's make sure that you, everybody can hear that. Um, I cannot hear the sound. 12,000 years later. Are you able to hear the video? Yeah, I can hear it now. Okay. Archaeologist is trying to figure out who you were, what was important to you, what video games you played, what you believed in, and what informed your decisions. Because you happened to live during a remarkable time in human history. The planetary revolution, when humanity transitioned, becoming a multi-planetary species. In that time, our numbers would explode by orders of magnitude. Our technology and standard of living would improve to levels previously thought impossible, and our self-conception would change forever. And all the future archaeologist has to learn about is your junk in the woods. While we can only hope that this will be someone's problem in 12,000 years, we have the same problem today. We're trying to reconstruct a revolution that took place 12,000 years ago. Today, only shadows remain of the people who experienced our distant past as their present. 
what remains from our past. We can look at our present in crispy 4K in color and sound. Three generations ago, the world was just black and white. One more generation and we see the world through blurred photographs. Further back, paintings and texts become our main way of experiencing the past. A mere 20 generations before us today, every written word had to be copied by hand, and reports became more scarce and less reliable. The first historian lived a mere 100 generations ago. For him, there are only epics and legends, and dead kings bragging on pieces of stone. 250 generations ago, there are only fragments left in the ground, and images stripped of their original meaning. Eventually, humanity becomes basically invisible. Still, we do know some things about our ancestors. Let's try to tell their story and what it means for us today. The Greatest Transition in Human History For some 2 million years, or roughly 80,000 generations, the life of our ancestors was basically the same. It was around 20,000 years or 800 generations ago that the behaviorally modern humans began a process that would change our lifestyle forever. At first, gradually, for some of us, then faster, for more of us, and then, suddenly, for almost all of us. Back then, there were about one million modern humans on Earth. Most other human species had died out, probably with a little help from us. Our ancestors' biology had given them the necessary tools. A general intelligence to understand things, a social intelligence to understand each other, and language to express abstract ideas and create new concepts. These were people just like you. They suffered and experienced joy, were bored, cried, and laughed. They lived in communities of a few dozen people. They controlled fire and had tools made from wood, stone and bone, told stories, mourned their dead, and created art. They traded with other tribes, from obsidian to shellfish. Some hunted big game and were very mobile, others relied more on plants they collected, and others mostly stayed in one area with an abundance of seafood. This was the common state of humanity for most of our history, until a slow transition, step by step, turned into a revolution. Step by step. The first solid evidence for this stems from the Jordan Valley, where our ancestors collected wild wheat more than 20,000 years ago. They noticed that seeds in the ground made more plants the next year. If they put good ones in one place, the next year they had more of the good ones. This was a great supplement to hunting and gathering. You could prepare some crops, return next year, build a temporary settlement, and have a secure food supply. Our ancestors used these bonus crops to bake the first bread and brew the first beer. With every generation, they gathered deeper knowledge about the plants and animals around them and how to manipulate them to their advantage. But there was a lot to learn. Very slowly, from generation to generation, pockets of knowledge expanded and were passed along to be expanded again. This early agriculture started to drastically reduce the space our ancestors needed to feed one individual which made it possible to stay in one place longer. Around 12,000 years ago, these little pieces of progress had reached a critical mass. Most of the calories we consume today stem from about 15 different founder crops that humans began to domesticate in earnest in the next few thousand years. What we call the agricultural revolution was not a thing that began suddenly one day. It was a slow process driven by small groups over many generations. Eventually, Gradual change gave rise to a new era. The human era. During the next few thousand years, progress would speed up and turn hunter-gatherers into farmers who lived in villages, towns, and then cities. When farmers moved into new areas, they replaced the nomadic tribes or turned them into farmers too. This was neither easy nor painless. In the early days, people had a diverse diet made up of up to 250 different plants and animals. For some of the groups transitioning to agriculture, the variation in their diets declined drastically, and some even seemed to have been undernourished. And living close together and with animals created a breeding ground for disease. 
virtually every infectious disease caused by microorganisms that have adapted to humans arose in the last 10,000 years. Cholera, smallpox, measles, influenza, chickenpox, and malaria. Mortality, especially among children, rose drastically. Still, our numbers grew because living in the same place enabled women to bear far more children than before, and for a farmer, more kids need more hands to work the fields. Even with more people dying younger, villages and towns grew. The number of humans on Earth exploded. About 100 generations after the beginning of the human era, there were already 4 million of us. This increased the need for food and forced people to come up with ever more efficient ways of producing calories, solidifying our new lifestyle. Going back to hunting and gathering would have just meant death by starvation for most. One question remains unanswered. Why? Why would people exchange the freedom of living off nature with a huge variety of food for the grind of agriculture and often more limited diets? Nobody knows for sure. Climate change seems to have made the transition possible, and some scientists argue that it was caused by external factors like undernourishment or overpopulation, both highly contested. Today, the most widely accepted idea is that it was a deliberate choice made by countless communities around the globe. Maybe it's also connected with what makes us human, the ability to come together, develop shared identities, and exchange stories and knowledge. Some archaeologists think that groups of hunter-gatherers traveled long and far to celebrate, to hold feasts and rituals. They would have used these occasions to talk about their version of innovation, better hunting and tool-making techniques, how to catch and breed animals, and which plants could be collected and multiplied. Maybe they even exchanged seeds. It's not unlikely that these gatherings were the catalysts that spread the knowledge of agriculture through the many isolated groups of humanity ultimately ending a lifestyle that was common to our species for thousands of generations. So by being able to come together, celebrate, share and learn from one another, these humans might have taken the steps that led to our modern world and we have much to be grateful for. We are still the same humans today, even if it often doesn't feel that way. Maybe it's time to come together to share what we know and celebrate our existence once again to begin another peaceful transition. Maybe the planetary revolution that will change everything once more. So, hopefully, in another 12,000 years, our descendants will look back on us today with gratitude for the amazing world they are able to inhabit. To celebrate the achievements of our ancestors in the last 12,000 years, and to look with hope towards the next 12,000, we present you with the fifth human era calendar for the year 12,021. This time, it's all about the journey of humanity. Beginning tens of thousands of years ago, leading into the revolution of agriculture, to ancient high civilizations, and the beginning of modern times, culminating in a vision for our future. You can get the limited edition now, until we sell out, and then, never again. As always, the calendar features 12 illustrated pages printed on high-quality paper in Europe and the US. And this year, the cover is especially shiny. Not only does the calendar look great on walls and makes it easier to dream about a glorious future and realize how far we've come as a species, it's also the best way to support Kurtzgesagt. The calendar enables a... Yeah, so I... Uh... Can you okay? Yeah, I think that, that was that was a good video. Um, so this video, uh, like you guys may have seen, it shows us the human um history uh on this planet and how these changes uh, happen quickly and uh, throughout like thousands of years, how human were able to events uh use their skills, uh their brain and uh. Uh, the experiment they're having in their environment to change their lives. So we have come a long way. So all these STEM um, theme that we have today um, just didn't happen like that. So people have to go from like harsh life to the life that we are having right now. So, and STEM, like you say, is a combination of science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. So all these uh, people have to come together and to bring all their 
knowledge so to improve the human um, experiment here on earth um so for that i don't know if you have any question you have any feedback any comments on this video feel free to just omit yourself and we can just have a discussion how does the video to relate to this technology we have today and that's 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 a good question right so uh, you see that uh, in the video when they were showing like people just like uh, living in farms and uh, like uh, people becoming more sedentary, um, having agriculture, and they were showing like one of like in the one of the scene when you have a uh, a woman giving birth and the the man was happy because he has like uh, extra hands to help him on the in the farm, and um, one thing also like in the video and they mentioned about diseases and they say the disease all these diseases we see today are cholera an example of disease is the covid right um the these respiratory diseases so all these happen in the recent like i believe he said 10000 year or 1000 year i can remember correctly so um uh, so these start happening when people started living together they started having uh, they started living like uh, in um uh, kind of a sedentary life where agriculture is there and the people having like you have a critical mass of people so so when people start living together you have diseases right so that's what brings the technology that's what changes the people's view right how do we cure these diseases how do we make sure that we don't die how do we make sure that when uh, my my uh, my uh, when the uh, kids are growing they don't catch a disease and die because they are weak at this point when they are like younger. So that's when people start like thinking. They start like, okay, um, do I need to fight? Uh, do I need to what 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 small what uh, like before it was like uh, uh, what plants right? What leaves do I need to uh, put together so um, I can like I can become healthy, right? I can cure these diseases. So it started like that. And until someone um, noticed that, oh, the diseases comes from like small organisms. And uh, he discovered like a microscope first. And uh, he said, okay, you see those small uh, organisms, they are the one causing disease, right? So how do we fight them? How do we kill them so they don't destroy us? They don't like put us down. So you see how the things, is, uh, things are evolving. So that's when we started like having like uh uh pill uh, we, we started having like remedies for some diseases until now we have all this technology and uh you know we have electron microscope electronic microscope that can see very small thing in a very like very detail right and we have uh, these like uh pharmaceutical uh corporations that like uh, were able to like discover um uh, ways to combat those like a uh, small organisms right that's when we start having vaccines to combat those so it didn't really happen like uh, uh, overnight it took a long time so for someone to discover those organisms the person has to come up with okay how do i make uh, things together how do i put uh, uh, like glasses together and we could, those glasses are called lenses right so you have a microscope so microscope, so you have to understand the physics of light. You have to understand how to put, uh, what's the distance between those lenses so I can have a good picture of these things, right? You have to understand like some, like you have to understand how plants work, biologists. They have to know, okay, what is what is a cell? They have to describe it. They have to describe those little things that killing people. They have to describe them. They have to understand how they procreate, how they multiply themselves. So that's when you start having scientists. You, have, you start having people like spending the majority of the lives of their lives to understand these phenomenons, right? So before at that time, we didn't have mathematicians. We didn't have um, engineers, but they were engineers, but nobody would call them like that. But they, they were like trying and it was trial and error until people spend most of their life to understand them. And people become, uh, at that point, people are becoming more specialized in the domain in a different domains. That's why today you have like uh, biologists, you have uh, uh, like a technologist. So now it's more specialized. Like before it was not like that, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's um, yeah.
like from the video that's what like this video comes from like m point of view uh and how the evolution went from uh these like human basic human needs in life to like more complex life that we are living today um is the question uh did you did you answer your question yeah, yeah it is, is my question so the gist of what you're saying is because of the communities that we create and because of how close we are as a society we come and team together every single generation to grow and grow and develop and find solutions and that's the part of stem because we use what we know our innovation to actually solve real life problems and create and explore so that's a good 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 summary so yeah you pretty much brilliantly summarized that thing um yeah so that's the point yeah, and i would it. like to add to yeah. abilu's answer to your question so this video is trying to also show to us that uh, the technology that we are enjoying today and the life we are living today it has been a case of progressive uh, uh, growth, progressive development, progressive elaboration. There was a time whereby we humans, we didn't know that uh, we can actually grow crops. All we were doing was hunting animals and hunting animals. And we now discover that if we drop a seed on the ground, it actually grows and produces more seed. So that way we now notice that, oh, we can actually grow crops by ourselves. That was growth. And then humans started growing agricultural products. From agriculture, we now discover that actually we can do better. Why don't we use animals to do some of our work? So if you remember, there was a time in the video whereby the farmer was using animals to drive some plowing equipment to plow the ground. So that was growth as well. So initially, we didn't know that we could actually grow crops. And then we now discover that we can use animals to do our work. So that was how the technology started growing. And then we now realize that animals cannot do all the work that we want them to do. When he, uh, if, you, if you watch some movies, you will see that uh, in maybe 100 or 200 years ago, the fastest way of traveling is to use a horse. But we now discover that we can actually make a small machine that we can use to walk around and from there man was able to discover a bicycle from bicycle we now discover that actually we can do better we can create a motorcycle from motorcycle we created a vehicle and now we now have airplanes as well it, the first man to discover the airplane he was just having fun with it he was just trying to see if he can get something to fly in the air and finally he did it and today we are flying on the air. We can travel from one continent to another. So technology has always moved from one stage to another through little by little growth, little addition. So whatever we are using today, the electricity, the internet, it all came about gradually. I remember like uh, 10 years ago when I was using the internet, the the speed at which I was able to download content, the speed at which my website was able to open was very slow compared to the speed we have now. So technology has been able to go and increase the speed. And even right now, many of us, we're already starting to use the new 5G, which is an improvement to the previous 4G and 3G that we have in our devices. So that's how we're going to continue to go. And very soon we'll you start hearing stuff like 6G, 7G, and things will continue to get better like that. Yeah, good, 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 uh, like, uh, explanation, uh, Lucky. Yeah, I understand it. But, yeah. So, yeah, so, like, you, the main thing from this video also is to know that STEM, what's the goal of STEM? Why would someone just go to school and study STEM? Uh, why will someone just, like, spend his, like, like, his or her entire like majority of their life to study this thing so the goal of this is to help humans to help their life to help humans live a better life that's why people some people spend most of their life is studying this thing these disciplines right the whole goal is to improve humans life that's why we are still going to school to still improving right like lucky was saying that 
back in the days, people were using uh, like uh, bicycles. They were using, and now someone discovered airplane, and they say airplane is going faster, right? So like still nowadays, people start to improve, like discover new things, right? Um, so the goal of STEM is to improve human life on Earth, right? We're trying to improve it, make life easier for us. Like he was saying about the internet, it was really slow, right? What if we just stop like that? Okay, okay, we don't wanna, we, no one wants to study that. So since they discover internet, we don't want to spend time on it anymore. So the speed will have stayed the same, right? We won't have the 5G today and the life will be much more complicated than what we are having right now. So moving on, we will have some couple more videos. So, so now we'll go into specific uh, disciplines, um, math, computer science, physics, and biology. So we'll tell you more about the um, uh, like recent and past discoveries that these like uh, disciplines have brought to uh, our human life and how they have made our life easier. Um, so lucky if you can just play those videos and uh, you can just make, make it bigger, um, expand it. In 1935, Albert Einstein was famously disturbed by an idea in quantum physics. When two particles are quantum entangled, they can instantaneously interact across vast distances. Einstein found this phenomenon spooky. Just the next year, Alan Turing identified a problem computers would never be able to solve. Computers usually operate based on inputs and outputs, but sometimes they can get stuck in infinite loops. Or improve, there's no way to tell when this will happen. He called it the halting problem. Today, we recognize it in the spinning wheel of death. In the 1930s, quantum entanglement and the halting problem seemed to have nothing to do with each other. But this year, they combined in a landmark proof that set off a cascade of solutions to open problems in computer science, physics, and mathematics. This is Henry Yuan. He's one of five co-authors of the proof. You know, what this paper is about, it's in computational complexity theory, which is like a, a branch of theoretical computer science. And it uh, talks about the computational power of a model of what's called interactive proofs. An interactive proof is a kind of logical interrogation method that models computation as the exchange of messages between two parties, a prover and a verifier. To understand how this works, Imagine the verifier is a police officer interrogating two subjects, the provers. You can't go out and confirm every single detail of the suspect's stories, but by asking the right questions and pitting your subjects against each other, you can catch them in a lie or develop confidence that the facts check out. The policeman will place these two suspects in different rooms, but it just so happens that these suspects also can share quantum entanglement to coordinate their responses in some uh, spooky quantum mechanical fashion. The policeman's job is to, to try to figure out what the truth really is. The main result of this paper is that even though the, uh, the suspects uh, might share quantum entanglement, the policeman can actually interrogate them in such a way that the policeman can figure out uh, the truth of uh, any mathematical statement uh, corresponding to an enormously complicated uh, range of questions. This means that in theory, a super powerful quantum computer could verify answers to even unsolvable problems like Turing's halting problem. It involved all these really beautiful pieces from different areas, things from computer science, uh, things from mathematics and physics that, you know, before we didn't think were that related to each other. And yes, they are. I think it points to something much more interesting. I don't know what, but uh, you know, there's a feeling that there's something more to, you know, there's like a whole new, new world to discover. This is John Horton Conway. His infamous knot problem eluded mathematicians for half a century. The question asked whether the Conway knot was actually a slice of a higher dimensional knot, a property called sliceness. This question proved answerable for thousands of similar knots, but Conway's resisted every attempt to untangle it. Lisa Picciarillo was a graduate student when she first heard about the Conway knot. Well, I just thought it was completely ridiculous that we didn't know whether this knot was sliced or not. And we had a lot of people doing this sort of thing, so I didn't understand, like, why it was all loving. The next day, which was a Sunday, I just started trying to run the approach. Um, for fun, and I worked on it a bit in the evenings just to try to see like what's supposed to be so hard about this problem. 
and then the following week, I had a meeting with Cameron Gordon, a senior topologist in, in my department, um, about something else, and, and I mentioned it to him. He was like, oh, really? You showed the comedy that's that slice? Like, show me. Um, and then I started to put it up. Uh, started asking kind of some dope questions, and then at some point, he got, he got very excited. Chirillo's proof was published in the Annals of Mathematics. It was it was quite surprising to me. I mean, it's, it's just one knot. In general, mathematicians prove things. We, we like to prove really broad general statements. All objects like this have some property. And I prove like one knot has a thing. I care about knots. Um, so, uh, I do care about three and four dimensional spaces, though. And it turns out that when you want to study three and four dimensional spaces, Mathematics can sometimes seem like a jumbled mosaic. Major areas of study have never been fully written down, and doing so would have required using thousands of other definitions that don't yet exist. Now imagine you had a library of Alexandria that contained the entire history and the sum total of mathematical knowledge. With everything cataloged, you could program an AI to verify increasingly complex proofs, and one day, hopefully, come up with new ones on its own. At Imperial College London, Evan Buzzard is in the process of digitizing math. He's teaching it to a software called Lean, which draws upon an ever-growing library of proofs and theorems. I decided that this software was... Yeah, so for the sake of time, we will not go through this. So you'll have an idea about like the discoveries people have been done, right? So you can see that these are young people and this working on these things and they were taking challenges and uh, they, 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 they are discovering things, right? So uh, we'll move on to the next uh, discipline uh, in physics. Um, this thing will be available for you if you want to like look into more into it. So we will share those little slides with you. What would happen if you fell into a black hole? If you'd asked Albert Einstein, he would have told you that according to his general theory of relativity, you'd be sucked into the black hole singularity, the point where space-time curves steeply inward and all the laws of physics seem to break down. After that, nothing can escape. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking took a semi-classical approach to black holes, bringing together quantum theory and Einstein's relativity. He proved that black holes emit a small amount of heat that eventually causes the black hole to evaporate. Still, according to Hawking, if you fell into a black hole, you and your particles would be lost to the universe forever. This is Don Page. He was a postdoc with Stephen Hawking, where they became friends, despite the fact that they ultimately landed on either side of one of the most controversial debates in modern physics. I wrote their Hawking's argument and I became not convinced by it. Hawking's work implied that black holes violated a central principle of quantum mechanics, called unitarity, which says that the present always preserves information about the past. So how could it be possible that black holes destroy information? This became known as the black hole information paradox, and for decades, it made physicists queasy. According to Page, if you were to fall into a black hole, you wouldn't be gone for good. Particle by particle, the information needed to reconstitute your body would reemerge. Well, it would be highly scrambled by the black hole. It'd be much worse than even you know if just body and then can it turn into smoke and ashes. But you know, in other analogies, if you burn up a book and then you have all the ashes, the information is still somewhere there, is somewhere in the universe equally. The key to understanding why the information is preserved lies in a process called quantum entanglement. When black holes emit radiation, that radiation maintains a quantum mechanical link to its place of origin. If you tried to measure the radiation or the black hole separately, the information would look random. But when you look at them together, they exhibit a pattern. Well, somebody took a coin and, 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 and cut it in half and sort of shook it up and put it into their world. Then, of course, there was what we call correlations. If one person gets ahead, you know, the other person gets ahead. And this, this quantum tangle is like that, except it's even more subtle. This is the page curve, which he 
created to track changes in the entanglement between a black hole and its radiation as it ages. The degree to which the information is entangled is called its entanglement entropy. At the start of a black hole's life, its entanglement entropy is zero, since it hasn't emitted any radiation. And at the end, its entanglement entropy is zero again, since the black hole has evaporated. But in between, as radiation trickles out, the entanglement entropy grows. It showed that, in theory, information can escape from a black hole. In a series of groundbreaking papers, physicists have shown that the entanglement entropy of black holes really does follow the page curve. Calculations give more evidence that the information does come out, but the details of how that actually happens, and, you know, still remain to be remain to be understood. And it, of course, it raises the picture that maybe space time itself is not fundamental. Maybe there's something deeper than space time, and maybe the basic quantum. Description will involve something that's not space and time. But I think there'll be parts of the puzzle I think that will persist for many more decades. Attempting to think of the brain as a computer. Digital computers process information by harnessing a network of billions of on and off switches called transistors. For decades, neuroscientists believe the brain functions in much the same way, with neurons playing the part of these simple switches. In this understanding of the human brain, neurons themselves weren't intelligible, with the entire network of 100 billion neurons that made the human brain the most advanced information processing machine. Or so we thought. In the 1980s, a more complex picture began to emerge. We learned that neurons aren't all the same. When stimulated, individual dendrites can express different voltages. This was the first clue that dendrites could be processing information independently, that our biological computing system might be more powerful than we thought. This is Yota Poirazi. A paper she co-published this year reveals just how much we underestimated neurons and dendrites. So when Matthew Larkum in his lab discovered the presence of some peculiar types of dendritic spikes, he came to me and we discussed what could be the functional role of these spikes. So the difference of this type of spikes compared to the ones we know already is the smaller the field, the smaller the amplitude of the dendritic spikes that they discovered something that had not been seen before in other types of animals, and we didn't know what could be their uh, functionality. Poirazi built a computational model of neurons as a two-layer network, where dendrites functioned like processors within processors. We designed uh, the model so that it would reproduce this decreasing amplitude behavior. What does this mean? It means that as you give the model a stronger excitable stimulus, the output of the model should get smaller. And we wonder what could be the computation that would benefit from such a feature. And we thought of exclusive OR. Exclusive OR function, known as XOR, is a complex logic game commonly seen in neural networks. It yields a binary output of 1 if 1 but only one of the inputs is 1. In other words, a signal is only passed on when it is graded with the right combination of inputs. Mathematical theorists thought an entire network of neurons would be required to compute the XOR function. And the main novelty of our work is this is no longer true. If you have a neuron that implements this type of a specific transfer function that is produced by the three spikes, then you can solve the exclusive order problem without requiring a large network. So while it may be tempting to think about the human brain as a computer, it's maybe more accurate to think about it as a hundred billion tiny supercomputers. Our individual neurons are much more powerful than the other types of neurons we've seen before in other types of animals. And this could in turn contribute to our increased cognitive ability. So for the sake of time, you will not show all of this video, but like I said before, uh, you have access to the uh, to the slides and you can watch more if you are interested. Uh, any questions on these videos?
Okay. So if we don't have any question, we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, okay. So on um, this slide will be uh, like is a discussion slide. So after watching all these like uh, videos, we have a little, a little bit of discussion earlier. So what interested you on uh, what is uh, what about it interested you and how does it work? Um, so feel free to unmute your mic and you know, um, say what, whatever interested you these videos. Okay, you don't have any question for that. So, um, what sorts of things do you think you humans should have already been able to do by now? By now. I I would like to go first. So, I think that uh, by now, we humans we should be able to build a spacecraft that will take us to other planets that is outside of our solar system. And at least get us closer to some of the stars. That's good. What would you say about that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is a good, like, uh, um, you know, uh, idea. So, uh, and I know like people are, working on it. Uh, Elon Musk is one of them trying to um, advance the technology. So we even have the opportunity to travel um, across the planets. Um, so I think we have a response in the chat. Let me see. Uh, find and share, and share a cure for can cancer. Okay. Yeah, yes. that, 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 that's a good thing. Yeah. Every, like, and I know a lot of people are working on it. We have uh, researchers in uh, biology here. And uh, a lot of biologists are trying to um, find a cure for cancer. And uh, I think uh, a lot of progress has been done in the past years, right? But it needs more work. And that's why we need, uh, like, scientists, you know, we need more STEM uh, people to, like, bring their, uh, their like, intelligence together, right? Um, that's why we are having this program, uh, the Black Family Technology Awareness Day, so people are aware of uh, the, like, uh, the challenges that's facing us humans. So another thing here I see in the chat uh, is I think by now we should find efficient ways to manage mental health during the pandemic. Good, good, good answer, right? So, yeah, so definitely, definitely by now we should have done it, right? So, and also like, uh, 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 Rudolph, like if you remember when we were watching the videos earlier, so uh, it's challenges that bring humans to go far to increase, like uh, to like uh, uh, come up with uh, solutions, right? So now with this pandemic, you know, I know people have come up with the same question you have right now, right? So people are trying to find um, the solution for that, the remedies uh, to deal with the mental uh, mental health, and uh, it's not only you, but uh, you know. And those people that I'm just saying, people, that can be you, right? You have that and you can do that, you know? Just for the question, how can I deal with this, you know? And how can I efficiently do that? Someone may come up with a solution, but you can also improve on that solution, right? So what do you think we will be able to do in 20 years? Okay, so I think we have some answers, right? Uh, let me see. Is that really? Okay. Uh, since now a lot of youth endured like two years of social ineptness and a whole generation of people. Um, uh, let me see. A whole. Uh, oh, in these things. Yes. Okay. A whole generation of people are affected negatively. Oh yeah, that's true. Right. Living on a pool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that's true. That uh, yeah, two years of social, you know, it has brought a lot of you know kids that didn't like lose a lot of time just being in like indoors and being socially that distance, you know. Um, so they they lost that, and that's like we say something needs to be done, right? Definitely something needs to be done, and that's why we are we as STEM 
uh, people, we need to find solutions on, for that. And so that doesn't happen in the future anymore. Yeah, living in a pool, right? That's a good, that's a good thing to think, right? To say in 20 years, right? Um, so yeah, so we're trying to go for the moon first, shoot for the moon. And now if we can live it, we can live on the moon, we will be living in a pool for 20 years. Wow. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, me, if I... For the uh, BGSA members, how do you think the research you're conducting will contribute to science in the next 20 years? I can go first. So I do a lot of, uh, I write a lot of code to, uh, that uses data to predict events. So I think that uh, in the next 20 years, the research I'm doing right now, I'll be able to uh, use data to predict that something, uh, an equipment is going to become faulty in the next one hour or in the next two hour if something is not done. So that way, if something is done, the, the faulty events will not happen. So I believe that in the next 20 years, we'll be able to have uh, uh, my work and some other persons who are also doing something similar, we'll be able to build AI models that will be able to predict if all those kind of faults and then also predict how we can prevent the faults from happening. Good, good. Yeah, so we have another answer here. Uh, in 20 years, hopefully, uh, create a cure for racism, social injustice, and poverty. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, that's one of the big uh, problems that we are having nowadays. And uh, I, think, I believe, you know, a lot of people will come up with ideas, new ideas, and STEM also is like a big, uh, putting a big uh, foot into this problem. Um, so definitely in 20 years, right? Um, hopefully we all are still alive and uh, we will be working toward that and you know, we will forget about this. You know, there will be like dark past, dark moments in our life, you know, looking back into nowadays, um, definitely. So uh, for the sake of time, we will move on uh, for the, Next slide. Okay. So moonwalking with scratch. So, uh, scratch, what's scratch? So you will see in the title of our presentation today is scratching the surface of uh, STEM, right? Uh, scratch is a, a, a program, like a, a programming language for that's made easy, user friendly. Uh, usually targets um, uh, students from eight to 16 years of old, uh, years, years old. And uh, um, it's uh, just a, a give you an idea about how computer programming is, right? So we talk about this progress that we have done. And uh, also one major uh, step forward was computers, right? Computers made our life easier, way easier. Like doing calculations for us, we have a cell phone um, that can do a lot of things. So all these things have to be computerized. So I, I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm trying to, um, give this explanation for like a, a, a easy for everybody to understand, right? So it's like uh, you have a, a machine. So a machine is just like a bunch of metals and stuff like cables, electrical wires. So how do you tell the machine to do something, right? Your car is a machine, it's a robot. Like a, an airplane is a robot, like it's a machine. How do you tell it? So you have to, like, you have to create something, you have to understand the language of the machine. We, we humans, we, we are speaking in English, right? So machines also have the language. So how do you like communicate with a machine in the same language? So that's what programming is. That's what computer science is about, right? So there is a little tutorial that we want to show, but uh, you may be, if you're interested, you, go, you can go through that you know, about how to do work with Scratch. Um, so we will go through like a small demo, uh, demo about uh, how we use Scratch to make things happen and you can do it at home right if you have a computer like computer and an internet connection it's easy so i will just share my screen uh, we're running out of time so we'll go and uh, just show uh, share that with you uh, so you understand how we can use computer language to do things that we want to do right so let me go through here okay let me share this let me know if you can see my screen I can see your screen. Okay. It's, yeah. All right. So, uh, how would you make this? so I see the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Scratch, like when you once you type, uh, you type in Google, right? Is Scratch? Let me just do that right now. Uh, Scratch. Right? So it will show up, 
and you have this here scratch so is a uh, is is uh, is uh, like uh, uh is done by MIT MIT like Massachusetts uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology is a big uh, technological school so you can go on that website just click on that and uh, you will find here like different projects that you can do you can work on like you know is already built for you but let's just go for uh, let's just click here start creating right so it will take us on a, to a different page um so from on this page i will show you how you can create your own thing how you can create your like you can create a story you can create a video game right just using this right so it's easy it's user friendly so this will make you understand how computer language is so uh so like on in this side of the screen you see there are some things called motion looks sound events control sensing operation variables and uh, my block so first of all we have to define what which one is our machine so in this environment we have this thing called sprite if you can see it here so this thing here called sprite this is our machine so the, basically we are controlling this thing right and so we have we want to speak its language so make uh, make this thing do what we want so we first go with motion motion so we have a block here that says move 10 steps, right? So these blocks is basically your language, right? Your gra grammar. So you take this, you bring it here. So this is the space where you are like uh, making your, like you are building your sentence for the machine to understand, right? So I can change that to like 20 steps, right? If I want the machine to go 20 steps, I can do that. So if I click on this, you think you will see that that thing will have moved 20 steps, right? I'll click on it again. You see it has moved 20 steps. So I can do that, like change that uh, to 50 steps. And when I click it, it will have most 50 steps. So let me tell this thing to turn. So I'll put this and uh, let me click on it. So it will turn 50 degrees. So let me say, okay, uh, turn 90 degree, right? So when I click on that, so it have to turn 90 degrees. So it just go, oh yeah, I'll bring it back here. So you have turned 90 degrees, I'll click on it again, and it'll turn 90 degrees. So, so you see that using all these blocks, I can make a whole story. I can make a whole game, right? So let's go from the looks. So the looks is like, you can tell the machine to say hello, right? When I click on that, it will say hello. That's it. You see that? It shows up for two seconds, six seconds. Hello, all right? So some of you may have been familiar with Scratch, so I'll just go over it very quickly. So. So you, the looks will, you know, it's just like telling the machine to do something. You know, you can change the appearance of the machine, uh, the sprite. In this case, the sprite. Uh, the sound, you can have this make sounds, right? Is it like, like your cell phone? Your cell phone can make sound. You know, you can download some stuff like that. So you have a program behind it that tells the machine what to do. So event, event is like uh, in computer language, event is like if you do something, something will happen. Right, like in uh, like uh, in uh, everyday English language, like event is like something happening, right? Computer like science, you tell the machine to do something. So what when something happens, if something happens, something else will happen, right? So that's what the event is. So in this case, let's say if uh, there's one block here, say when the flag, the green flag is clicked, the, all these events will happen. So let me see if that works. All right, let me click this green flag. Oh, okay. So after I green flag. Click that, you see, it did, it does every, all these things at once. You see that hello showing there? Okay, so yeah, you have controls. You can have this thing happening forever and uh, like in a loop, happening over and over again, right? So all this thing is here. So uh, if you have a more question you can ask, for the sake of time, I'll just go straight to like one of the programs that we have done to show you how we can make something more complex with uh, Scratch, right? So here I've put like a, a lady that will be dancing on a, a like a, with a music a background music, right? So you see how complex this can be quickly, right? So if you know what you're doing, you can just change all these things at once and make the the machine or the here in this case a human dance and stuff like that, all right? Let, let's start, right? I don't know if you can hear my uh, audio, but there will be some background music there. Okay, I'll stop that and start it again. I will make an enlarge the screen. Uh, 
Right. Okay. So you see how uh, we can make this like a program putting all these blocks together. We can create a little story. Uh, we have a dance party right now. So yeah. So that's that's how you can use computer right to make all these things happen. Uh, happen. So it's just an introduction for you to understand how uh, we can the computers do things. Right. Um. So uh, uh, lucky. So from that side, I think we are a little bit. Uh, we are three fifty now. So. I'll let you share the rest of the slides so we can talk to it very quickly. If you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Okay. Yeah, so to summarize everything we've discussed today, I would like to wrap up by telling you that uh, science gives everyone an opportunity to explore all every bit every bit of idea we have on our head. If you have a if you have an idea you want to let you see a, a problem, let's say you see that uh, something is not right or something that you feel you, uh, humans could do better about science gives you an opportunity to think of a solution you can see right now the world is going through the covid 19 pandemic one question i've been asking myself is is it possible for us to develop drugs that once there is any pandemic there's any virus that we humans have not seen before we can just add one or two things to that drug and immediately a, the drug will be able to cure everybody from that pandemic. You could imagine if we add such a drug today, by now we would have been out of the COVID-19 pandemic and everyone would be living their life again. So science gives all of us the opportunity to think of how to solve problems and you can be part of that solution. You can be a part of that team who is trying to provide solution to all the problems that we have in our world today. And by providing those solutions, we're able to make the whole world a better place. All of the technology that we're using right now, they are all a product of people who try to think of better ways to do things, new ways to do things, how to make life much and much better for everyone. So I will wrap up by with this quote by telling us that uh, the distance between being a genius and someone who is insane is only measured by success. If, if, if people think that, oh, you are insane, but your insanity is producing good success, everyone is going to hail you as a genius. Everyone is going to hail you as a hero. So whatever that thing is that you have on your mind, science is right here. Science is willing to give you the opportunity to explore and see if you can get a solution out of it. And Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.